This podcast is sponsored by Sophie Reeptress. She makes cave suits. Have you thought about taking the plunge on getting a suit and uh, and not just, you know, going to Goodwill and getting old dress pants and poly pro? That's what I always did. But nothing will come close to a cave suit from Sophie. Sophie Reeptress makes all these cave suits herself. She's uh, based in Philadelphia. She started caving and she was looking for cave suits and she didn't see a lot to choose from. There's definitely some stuff out there, but she decided she would make her own. And the ones that she makes are made with 500 denier cordura and a little thicker, twice as thick, 1000 denier cordura, where it counts in the elbows, the knees, You know, where you need a little extra reinforcement. Lots of colors to choose from. Her cave suits start from just, you know, basic suits. She'll add pockets. She'll add uh, inside pockets, knee pad pockets, so you can just slip the pads right in there. She's doing bat stencils. And her fabrics come in a variety of colors. You really should see her website, sophiereapdress.com. You can find her on Instagram as well. She's got like 30,000 followers. She does really incredible work. Sophie Reapdress. For great cave suits made to order just for you. Welcome to the Caving Podcast. My name's Matt Pelser. I'm your host. I'm from the Central Indiana Grotto, former chair of the Central Indiana Grotto. A grotto is a local chapter of the National Speleological Society. And if you're thinking about caving, you really should get involved with a grotto uh, because caving is not like hiking. You can't just go and do it by yourself, especially if you're new at it. And, And so grottos are kind of a way to make friends and make sure you're doing it right. There are a number of safety protocols that we uh, insist on following and you should too, because uh, it's like, like a lot of things, it's dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. And once you get to know what you're doing, it's uh, quite the opposite. So get involved with your grotto. And I've got a link in the description of this podcast where you can find your grotto through the NSS website, caves.org. Um, so get involved with the grotto. You don't have to join right away, but we would appreciate it. And then we would appreciate it if you also joined our uh, national organization, the National Speleological Society, the NSS. Uh, dues are about 40 bucks a year for the NSS. I know my grotto, grotto is like 15 bucks a year. So it's a, a pretty affordable thing to keep involved with. Um, I've gotten an awful lot of emails over the last month or so uh, on the Caving Podcast. I'm sorry if I either haven't gotten back with you or if it's taken me a a while to get back with you. It's just kind of how it goes sometimes, especially if I get an email on the weekend. I try to stay off email on the weekend. I don't know if it's laziness or just, you know, the desire to not be connected. But um, I have taken a while to get back to some people, and I apologize, especially when it comes to the podcast. Like if I'm getting a work email, you're you're not going to get anything back from me until Monday. Uh, But when it comes to caving, I really should be better about getting back with people. So thank you for recommending guests. Um, It's always better to introduce me to the person that you are recommending for the podcast rather than to just say, hey, uh, why don't you ask this person? Because if they know you and they don't know me, then maybe it's better if it's coming from you than coming from me. So thank you again for your emails. You can email me as well, alpineproductions at gmail.com. I've gotten a lot of great guests who are coming on the podcast later this year from your emails. And I I just really appreciate it. And it makes me thankful every time that I get an email for the community, the caving community. We are such a supportive community. And I just, I, I'm really thankful for all of the support that this podcast has gotten. I just really appreciate it. Um, No caving this past month, but I wanted to share this. Um, I, for the last, um, I guess you could say 11 years, but I, I did a few things before that have been a voiceover actor and, you know, I'll do commercials or I'll do, you know, narration. I do a lot of technical narration, medical narration, things like that, which is really, really great. Um, I kind of pride myself on being able to do those and getting the pronunciations right and things like that. But one of the things I've always wanted to do is to voice something having to do with nature, either a nature documentary or, or something like that. And I wanted to let you know that I got a pretty cool job, with the Nature Conservancy recently. And I know that feelings on the Nature Conservancy range when it comes to caving, because the Nature Conservancy has a tendency to purchase land with caves and then close the caves. And, you know, some cavers have strong opinions about that. But uh, I ultimately see the work that the Nature Conservancy does as a net positive for preserving nature and the like. And I've used my involvement with them to sort of um, start some conversations where cave access is concerned with them, you know, I'm just kind of trying to be careful with it. But they hired me to do uh, a sizzle reel, I guess, on their capital campaign, which was pretty cool and which should be done, I think, sometime this spring. 
Um, when it's available, I'll, I'll put the link out somehow uh, and so you can see it. And I was also approached to do something a little more cave related that I can't really talk about, but um, I am really looking forward to doing that. If you're involved in that, I'm still interested <laughs> um, and you know who you are and what I'm talking about. It's just uh, another another part of my professional life that I thought I'd talk about real fast. Um, and another thing that I found out this past month, I am officially the MC of the Indiana Cave Capers Banquet again in 2023. I've been doing that off and on for the last several years, and uh, they officially asked me again, which was awfully nice of them, um, my own grotto and our annual event. So I will see you on uh, the first weekend in August. Uh, and a reminder, I am coming to Sarah May 4th through the 7th at Caver's Paradise, hoping to do some caving interviews down there and some caving. And we talk a little bit about Sarah in this interview with Kelly. Oh, my goodness. Kelly Smallwood. I have followed um, Kelly's journey with cancer uh, sort of ever since she found out that she had it in 2017. Gosh, five years ago now, almost six years ago. And we get into that right off the bat. It was such a an honor to be able to talk with her. I I... She was on my radar through social media, and thanks to Fen Spencer for hooking me up. And it was funny because the week after I interviewed Kelly, I went caving with Jeff Gosnell of the Near Normal Grotto when they came to Indiana, and he said, you know who you ought to have? You ought to have Kelly Smallwood. And I said, you know what? I just talked to her this past week. So that was cool. Kelly talks about caving for Jack Daniels. Yeah. And she talks about getting paid to survey and what she bought with the money when she got paid to survey a particular cave for a particular reason. We'll get there. She talks about importing cave gear. And she's got a YouTube channel, which I put in the show notes if you want to check that out. Pretty impressive videos. So here we go. Here's this month's talk with Kelly Smallwood. So, Kelly, I mean, I've admired your your sort of online presence for a while. And then when we got the uh, cancer diagnosis, I followed it pretty closely. How is that going, by the way? So I am five years survivor now. So I was originally diagnosed in 2017, and I just celebrated that five-year cancer-free bursary <laughs> back <laughs> in September. So, yes. Is this one that I – mean, it was breast cancer, right? Yes, it was actually triple positive breast cancer, which is a very aggressive form of breast cancer, and I was stage 2B, so it had spread beyond my breast into my lymph nodes under my arm. That's a tough diagnosis. Is that one that can be considered after a time cured? I know that the word cured is not tossed around lightly in the cancer world, and some cancers can be cured and others, they, they, they refuse to use that word. Uh, maybe forever and certainly some for a time. What's that look like? There's always a risk that it'll come back. There's always that monster on your shoulder, you know, that you're constantly looking back at going, is, is this going to happen again? Um, there's a huge chance of recurrence with breast cancer, at least 30% with the type that I had. But the further out you get from it, the, the less likely it is to return. Um, but that's not saying that it can't happen again. Okay. So, uh, I mean, look, we'll get into caving here before too long and caving with cancer, but I, I just yeah. want to make sure that everything's okay. I mean, it seems like you're, you're cancer free for five years. That's a good, that's a good number. What did you have to do to get to that point? Uh, just stay busy. <laughs> Keep my mind <laughs> off of it for the most part. Um, I, I was one of, I'm one of those people that cancer is a part of my journey. It's not who I am. Right. So I certainly did not let it take over my life. One of the things my doctor told me is, you know, don't just sit on the couch, you know, because if you just sit on the couch and feel sorry for yourself, you're going to kind of just lose it all. And that's just not good for you mentally e either. So I decided to continue caving throughout my cancer journey. Now, <laughs> obviously, I, I didn't want to become a rescue or get in, you know, to over my head with a uh, with caving with cancer, because I mean, I, I'm used to just some pretty hardcore caving, but um, I did keep it to 100 foot pits, no more. <laughs> <laughs> um, I caved with my port. I actually made a little pillow to go under my um, rope walker caving system to give me some protection there because I was on uh, chemo for over a year. Oh, my goodness. Uh, 
Yeah, so I, I just kept moving and just, uh, I was afraid if I stopped caving that it would be harder to get back into it um, after cancer. So I just kept with it. Other treatment, you, did you have a double mastectomy? I did. Um, so initially I was not prepared to have a double mastectomy. I was told that I, it was a good chance that I was going to be able to keep my breast. Um, so I had a lumpectomy and they took out 13 lymph nodes at that time. And two weeks later, my doctor called me and said um, he was not able to get clear margins. So they had to go in and do another lumpectomy. So I went in, they did the surgery again. A week later, I got another phone call and he said, Kelly, th this is just not normal. We still didn't get clear margins. And so he suggested uh, at least a single mastectomy. Um, but I made the decision to do a double because just for symmetrical reasons. And sure, sure. <laughs> Yeah, and I didn't want to have reconstruction because reconstruction is a whole nother uh, ball game. I mean, they take muscles from different parts of your body to reconstruct your breast, and there's still never any feeling there. So for me, there was no advantage um, to go through all of those extra surgeries. So I decided to do what they call stay flat. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. And I, please, if I if if I'm getting too personal here, please just feel free to tell me to stop. I'll edit whatever. But um, like, is that an advantage in caving? <laughs> um, well, actually, I thought it might be. Um, but what I've learned, it's more about those bones in your chest, and ah. not the tissue, because the tissue kind of tends to move and squish. So uh, prior to cancer, I could do I think it was eight and three quarters in a squeeze box. Now I can only do eight and a half. So it, it's not a huge advantage, um, you know, as far as that. <laughs> it's a good goes. quarter inch, though. I mean, that sometimes yeah. that counts. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But no, I don't mind sharing my cancer journey. I was diagnosed at age forty. And, you know, I never thought that that would happen to me, especially at such a young age. You think of breast cancer as being, you know, something your grandmother age, you know, females get or even males for that matter. And I just never thought about it. So I, I'm very open with sharing my journey because I, I, I want to bring light to it. A lot of people don't share their cancer journey. And I think sharing it just kind of gives courage to other people, especially when they're diagnosed and, and they go through the same thing. They can see, you know, that there is you know, light at the end of the tunnel and you can still do things that you're used to doing in, in your normal life. Well, and it sounds like you were cautious about it, you know, um, maybe backing things off from the hardcore caving that you had done yeah. prior and, you know, fashioning the pillow around the port. And my, my mom's currently undergoing uh, immunotherapy for cancer right now. And so the, the, the whole port thing, protecting the port is uh, sort mm -hmm. of top of mind for me and my family. But when you say you were doing hardcore caving, what I guess is it was a typical trip prior to the treatment and maybe maybe something that you're back to doing now. Um, we would consider hardcore caving multi-drop caves, especially if there's a lot of water where you're rappelling either in or right next to the water. You know, 400, 450 feet deep multi-drops where you make it all the way down to the bottom. You explore the cave and then you've got to make your way all the way back out all of those different drops. So you may be looking at a trip that might be well beyond your, you know, average six to eight hour trip. I mean, the longest we've actually spent in a cave is uh, 30 hours. We've done that twice. When we were surveying Wonder Cave, we would do camp trips in there. So in that 30 hours, we would sleep a little bit, but definitely long, you know, trips where you get very exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the kind of thing that you were doing before. And um, then when the chemo and stuff started, I mean, did that were you on the kind of chemo that would really make you kind of feel it as far as like getting more and more tired, more tired than you would have otherwise, I guess? Oh, most definitely. Yeah. Um, I did six rounds of uh, TCHP, which is a, a cocktail of four different chemos. So I would go into the oncology doctor's office there in Chattanooga. Jason would get up and he would drive me. We would get there about eight o'clock. I would meet with my doctor for a few minutes and then they would get me hooked up on my port and they would start that cocktail. And I was there all day long, literally till about four o'clock in the afternoon. Because in between the chemos, they give you other medicines to try to help offset 
the side effects from the chemo. So it's just, it's ridiculous how many drugs you're on. And I, I've got a picture on my blog on one point I posted of all just the, the pills I was on. Like I had enough to cover across the whole top of my chest, you know, all the pill bottles. Um, but with the chemo, you, you learn there's a pattern with it and you know when each side effect is going to come. So I would know, I would get it on Thursday, Friday, I would feel, you know, okay. Come Saturday, I would feel my worst. I knew exactly what time I was going to start throwing up. Sunday, you get like this whole body pain. Monday, the brain fog. So you, you get this pattern with the chemo. And so towards the end, you get to a point where you're just sick of it. And I can certainly understand why some people decide to quit chemo um, because it, it's just such a hard thing to go through. But Jason uh, was a strong encourager and encouraged me to continue doing it. He's also a cancer survivor. He had Hodgkin's lymphoma when he was a teenager. So he had been through chemo. So he encouraged me and, you know, was right there by my side through every, every appointment and everything. And so, yeah, we got through it and it, it there's nothing pretty about um, breast cancer. I, I get a little, you know, emotional about it. You could probably hear it in my voice a little bit, but I hate pink, you know, because pink's pretty and there's nothing pretty about cancer or, mm -hmm. you know, breast cancer for that matter. <laughs> well, when you dig into, you know, some of the, I don't want to say f frauds, but I mean, it's kind of fraudulent. Some of the fundraising and whatnot around breast cancer awareness, it's a lot of it's for show, it seems like, when you yeah. really dig into it. Mm -hmm. And it's it's kind of refreshing to hear the. <laughs> You were sick of pink because uh, I kind of am, too, um, when it comes to that. It's like, well, it, you know, it, awareness is good, but m money is better. So uh, let's yeah. put it in the right place, I guess. Um, yeah. When you were in the midst of chemo uh, and you were at a place where you could actually do a trip, seems like before you were doing big trips, you talked about the 30-hour trips in Wonder Cave. What was an exhausting trip when you were on chemo uh, in terms of, like, amount of time spent in the cave and things that you did? Um, I would say, you know, if we were doing something horizontal, maybe just two to three hours. And, okay. and the, the pits that we did, I, like I said, I kept it less than a, a, a hundred foot. Yeah. And those, those were just, you know, mostly blind pits. And Elmore actually, um, after my diagnosis, gave me uh, a pink rope. So we used it a lot on those trips. What well, a pink, I've never seen yep. a pink rope. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it's made by Highline. It, they made a pink, pink rope. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Okay. All right. Well, if we come back to cancer, then uh, then we'll talk more about that. But I kind of want to get some background on uh, yeah. on your caving life. So wh what did it for you? Wh where'd you start? So I actually started caving 20 years ago this year when my daughter was two. Huh. Um, her father, my first husband, he started caving with my sister and my brother-in-law and I thought they were absolutely crazy. They're like, you want to go? And I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> like, you know, most people's normal reaction. And then when my daughter turned two, uh, for some reason, I just decided to go. And so my first cave that I went to was Hurricane Cave over in Georgia. And I don't know if you've been there or not, but it's got a culvert pipe entrance. The uh, state of Georgia built the interstate over the cave. And so they put this hundred foot long culvert pipe in uh, it's three foot in diameter, so cavers could still access the cave, and it, it, it just sparked my interest. I fell in love, and uh, I guess I would say I honestly became obsessed, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so much to the fact that, you know, I, I, I lived near Atlanta. I grew up in uh, Douglasville, and in 2011, I was done with all the concrete and then just city life because every time I would drive up here, you know, to what I call the heart of tag, it just called to me. It's like, this is your home. So I, I met Jason in 2009 and we had long distance dated. And uh, so finally in 2011, I, I pulled the trigger and moved up here. And uh, so for you, the heart of tag then is is where sort of exactly. <laughs> I mean, not, not, not like your address, but like, right. Where are you? Um, for me, the heart of tag is Marion County, Tennessee. I'm, I'm literally with miles, just a few miles within where the three States meet, you know, oh, perfect. In that, that corner. So I work here now in Marion County and I live here and I mean, I'm just, I'm living my best life. 
Yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen pictures. We're friends on Facebook. I've seen pictures of your uh, kind of homestead out there. And it seems like after the cancer diagnosis happened, you guys – and I don't know. Maybe it was taking place before then. Um, but it seems like you guys made some really, really fun improvements at the house there. You're in a house in the middle of the woods. You've got this nice, like – step down forgive uh, forgive me if i'm wrong and correct me if i'm wrong but you've got this nice step down to like a hot tub out there too oh yeah (laughs) gorgeous yeah we've got 20 acres here we started off with almost six and then we've just added on and you know after my cancer diagnosis i had i was working in chattanooga and so i was driving 47 miles each way to work and after my cancer diagnosis i was like i don't want to spend two hours plus in a car every day anymore and so I worked really hard um, to get a job here locally Um, so I got that time back which gave me you know it it opened up more money (laughs) you know I'm not spending all that money on gas so we bought more land around us and it gave me more time in the evenings to go caving after work (laughs) (laughs) are any caves on your property um, not on our 20 acres. Now, in the cove behind us, there are three caves that are within, you know, a short hike. But we do own a cave over near Orm, Tennessee, which is close to where the Russell Cave National Monument is. Mm. It's um, it's called Larson Well, and it's a 161-foot entrance pit. It's got a second pit that's about 40 feet and about 500 feet of cave. So we got really, really lucky buying that one. Um, we actually picked it up in a tax sale here in Marion County. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With five acres. And a lot of people are just amazed when I tell them this. We got it for $697. Oh, my gosh. That's the dream, <laughs> yeah. Kelly. <laughs> yeah. That was, I, I'm going to say that was pre COVID. Uh, you know, tax sales, because now a lot of people are getting more into that. So it's really hard to, to score a deal like like we did. That was um, seven years ago when we scored that. So. Man. All right. I don't mean to keep jumping around here, but I kind of want to go back to the very beginning and sort of your yeah. ideas on caving just before you started caving, the whole, you know, no thanks thing. So what was your hang up? Did you think that you were claustrophobic and then you later found out you're kind of not? Or did you just have no interest in getting muddy and dirty and later found out that you kind of liked it? What What was your hang up? It was the claustrophobia. I thought that I would just be terrified, you know, of the tight spaces because I have a big fear of water. Um, and that's still a big fear for me um, of, you know, just drowning and, you know, caving and with boots on, you're just heavier. And so it was mainly the claustrophobia. But then once I got in there and I realized, you know, it's not all crawling, it's not all tight. There's a lot of big, beautiful borehole passage and just so many beautiful things to see. And no two caves are the same. So it's just kind of like this I don't know, this feeling to just see as many as I can. <laughs> I think then that you lucked out being in TAG because were you maybe uh, up here in Indiana, maybe you wouldn't have stuck with it. <laughs> We've got a yeah, few wide true. open spaces, but it's a lot of crawling up here. Yeah, we we are very spoiled here in TAG. And, <laughs> and I do recognize that and I know that. And, you know, we, we try to go cave in, in other regions of the United States when we travel, especially for conventions. Conventions make it super easy, you know, to go caving in other regions. But um, without those, it can be harder. It, you know, there's a lot more secrecy in other regions where here in TAG, we're like, yeah, come on down. We'll show you where they all are. No problem. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you've been caving up here in Indiana. I have not been to Indiana. No? Jason has, but I have not. So um, maybe this year I've I've started doing um, some side dealing, I guess, of some land joff cave gear. Uh, so maybe I'm going to start traveling around and doing some caving events and uh, trying to promote that land joff gear because I just absolutely love it. Okay, well let's let's give that let's give that stuff a, a, a mention here. So what what is that, that you're talking about? So Landjoff is a caving gear company. They're out of Bulgaria. They make cave packs and they make cave suits and they make some other stuff for canyoneering and some water sports, but I'm just selling their cave packs and their suits. They're extremely affordable and durable. They're made from PVC and the colors of them are really awesome too. They've got some really bright colors in their packs. They've got different packs for different types of caving. And I've been using their caving packs for about 10 years now. So last year, 
I just reached out to them and I was like, you know, nobody here in tag sells your gear and I love it. And people are always asking me, Hey, what is that? And so I just pulled the trigger and they sent me a bunch of gear and now I'm selling it kind of as a, I guess a side hustle, if you will, because, <laughs> you know, I'm like, Hey, you need to pack. Here you go. I kind of like out of the trunk kind of feel. How'd you come across it? Um, I think at one point somebody I was caving with had bought one of the Landjoff packs off of eBay. And so that was where I bought my first pack. And it's actually uh, West Virginia Underground. They were they're actually they were selling them through eBay initially. They sell them up there, um, but down here in Tag, not very many people know about them. And so I, that's how I got my first pack was through uh, them through eBay. Um, so I want to come back to the caving genesis. So you take those first few trips, you're kind of hooked. Did you frequent certain caves or did you try to go to different ones every time? What was that journey? So initially, yes, when I first started caving, it was my first husband and a couple of his buddies. And so we went to where we knew, um, which was a lot of times the same cave uh, in Georgia, because that's where I was living. And then, uh, you know, after a few years of that, we actually had uh, separated and divorced and he got out of caving, but I stuck with caving. I mean, it. he kind of was he joked with me and said, you took that for me. But I mean, I just fell in love with caving. And so once we had split. I then joined the Dogwood City Grotto in Atlanta. And so I started caving with the DCG and doing a lot of their grotto trips and things like that. And then that was how I had met Jason. He had came down to a DCG meeting with a, a, another caver friend of his and they did a presentation. And then I just kind of kept bumping into him. And so then we started caving together and Jason's not really one of the cavers who just goes to all the popular, you know, pits that everybody knows about. And he was already surveying and doing project caving. So we started doing project caving together. And uh, you mentioned Wonder Cave, and I'm sure we'll get to Wonder Cave, but like, uh, what are some of the highlights from your project caving? Oh, goodness. I'll tell you, probably one of the biggest highlights was getting contacted by the Jack Daniels Distillery and being asked to survey a cave on their property. That that was a a pretty amazing experience. Um, There's the the famous Jack Daniels cave, you know, that the water comes out of that their whiskey's made with. And then there's another cave up above it called Motlow Cave. And they had dug that cave open in the 80s and turned it into a commercial cave to kind of give you know, the tours, another thing to see. Well, it didn't really last very long and they shut it down and they had done a map at the time, um, but they wanted it remapped because they wanted to start reusing the cave. And so they, they brought us in. They actually treated us like employees. We had to go through their safety training and all of that. And they let us go in the cave and survey it. And it, it was a really awesome experience. And we actually, I really want to talk about Marion because Marion was pretty close to us and yeah, we, yeah. we always brought him in on our project caving and there was a lot of historical signatures in that cave. And so we brought him on, on that project too. And he found some civil war signatures in that cave that had been undocumented. And wow. Um, so that that's definitely probably as far as survey goes, definitely probably one of the biggest highlights um, in exchange because, you know, we don't get paid to survey except for one time we did. And I can talk about that, too. But in exchange for surveying that cave for Jack Daniels, they then allowed us to have a Tennessee Cave Survey meeting on site and then let the Tennessee Cave Survey members go into Motlow Cave, you know, at no charge as well. So that was really cool, too. Civil War Signatures was kind of his thing, right? It was, yeah. Any any time you we found signatures in caves, or if we found virgin cave, <laughs> we always called Marion. He was such a good mentor to us and the history. And I loved history before, but he just really, you know, ignited that in that you know in me more, you know, to to do research. And so I love doing caves that have a lot of history, especially surveying them. Mm. Yeah. What a loss to the caving community. I mean, you know, he had been around an awful long time. I love the fact that the New York Times called him, what, the uh, the world's most prolific <laughs> cave explorer in his yeah. obit. I mean, mm-hmm. for a caver to get an obit in the New York Times is pretty, pretty significant. Um, yep. He was a very special person. <laughs> Motlow Cave. So you you took Marion along to that, and that was on the Jack Daniels Distillery property. 
And so you said that they had had it surveyed. It was kind of a show cave before. After you surveyed it, how did, say, your map, if you made a map or your data compared to what existed already? It was pretty similar. The only major difference was at one point in the cave, there was a pit. And we believe that they, and, and there was nobody currently on staff that could confirm this for us, but we believe that at one point they had driven, you know, like a bobcat or something in this cave because it was big enough to where they could. And they buried that pit because it was kind of in this big room where they had showcased this really large formation in the middle of the floor and you would have had to kind of walk around that pit. So we suspected that they buried it for their you know, safety reasons for tourists. But other than that, that was the only the only real big difference. Jason's map was a lot more detailed for them, though. I'm sure that it was. So you kind of had to go through protocols to to make that happen. Did did any of that seem stifling to the exploration or was it just kind of, you know, another thing or two that you had to do that you wouldn't have otherwise had to do had it been your project? Oh, no, we were excited about it because, you know, they gave us name badges and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Which came off as soon as you got in the cave, I'm sure. Oh, no, we wore them because oh, actually uh, Motlow Cave, well, there is one area in Motlow Cave that I will say is probably the most difficult 20-foot pit I've ever done in my life because mm. there was no natural rigging for it. And there's this really tight squeeze you have to get through to this area that's called the New Discovery. Obviously, this part isn't open to the tourists, um, but you had to rig your rope about 100 feet back to do this 20-foot pit, and it was over flowstone. So it was quite the challenge in there. Oh, my goodness. So you didn't get paid to survey that, but you've gotten paid to survey elsewhere? That's correct. So we actually got a phone call from a, another caver friend of ours who had a friend up in uh, West Virginia who was doing some uh, work with the Appalachian Power Company. They were putting in some new high tension power lines and they had a, somebody on the ground who was basically scouting where these power lines were going to go. And if they found a hole in the ground, they just marked it as a cave. And so they contacted us and brought us in to survey those caves that were found or not necessarily caves. Some were, you know, just holes that didn't turn out to be a cave. Um, to, so that way when they put their power lines in, they would know if they were hitting a cave or not. Hmm. Um, so that was a pretty cool experience. We took the money that we made from that um, and bought new headlights at that headlamps at that time. We bought some El Spilio Nomas. So that was a, you know, kind of a good trade off. Hey, we'll survey for some nice, new, expensive cave gear. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Wonderful to hear. What else as far as highlights from uh, Project Caving? Um, obviously, Wonder Cave, that was a really big, um, you know, project for us. We ended up mapping uh, right at three miles of cave there. It was previously only listed as 7,000 feet long with a Tennessee cave survey. So we almost tripled the, or doubled the length of it. Um, that, that took about 14 months. Jason and I actually, when we were looking at places to get married, we had wanted to get married at Wonder Cave and we had tried to reach out to the landowners at that time, but it, it just didn't work out. They were kind of didn't want to respond to us at that time. But then we later got into um, some friends of ours got into a private party that was going on there and started talking to the landowner's son about surveying. And so that kind of got us in with him. And so Jason went and talked to him, showed him some of his maps. And he's like, this was like in September. And he was like, so you think you could survey it and have it done? And I could give it to my dad for Christmas. And Jason was like, well, maybe Christmas from two years from now, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because people don't understand how much goes into the work that is involved in surveying a cave. You know, for every hour that we spend surveying in a cave, Jason spends at least that much, if not more, drafting the map. So you've got all this time, you know, that, that's involved. But that was a really wonderful project. It turned out to be a very beautiful map. He had it on display at um, convention this past summer, uh, 2022, in South Dakota, and he got a uh, an honorable mention award on that as well. Nice. That's some stiff competition. So to be recognized at all is uh, it must be a really really nice map. Oh yeah, and I'll tell you that <laughs> the uh, the survey, the cartography salon. It's yeah, it's 
it's very, very tough competition there. So I'm, I'm always proud of Jason and his maps. He does such beautiful work. It's almost like an artwork in a way. It is. It is. It absolutely is. I mean, I love looking at a good cave map. You know, you, you, you see the really basic ones, the rudimentary ones, even the hands, the old hand sketch ones. And then you see some of these modern ones that people do on like illustrator and things like that. And it's just like, wow, okay. I know exactly what I'm getting into with one little glance of that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Jason's maps are pretty easy to read. The problem uh, nowadays is when you get really large cave maps. And I mean, even like Wonder Cave, he sketched it at one inch is 40 feet. You really can't downsize that, you know, to to make it usable in the cave. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you know, so you, you've really got to study, you know, the, the newer maps uh, before you go in the cave or print smaller sections of them, you know, if you will. So you get into Wonder Cave, you you finish the survey, the length is double. You've spent some, you know, long trips in Wonder Cave. Can you describe what kind of cave it is? So the first quarter mile of cave is tourist cave. And there's a a stream that comes out of the cave, so you're walking along the stream. You are in some muddy areas so you know like any cave you got to be careful you can slip several of us have slipped through that section and then you come into this really big beautiful upper level that's just full of formations and large formations like it was so hard surveying in that area because you're like kind of in the middle but there's no walls because it's just formations and formations and rows of them and they're just so big once you get past that area the cave then gets down into a stream passage and you very quickly come to what's called the swim. It's a 400 foot long swim that you have to go through to get to the rest of the cave. And it's pretty interesting because when we went to survey it, we had to try several methods to survey through this swim. We tried those cheap blow up boats from, you know, like Walmart. And we gave them all <laughs> cute names like the SS Hardwood and <laughs> Cave Paddler and things like that. But those things get popped pretty easily. Yeah, I imagine. So we, we later learned that inner tubes were the best um, to get us through that passage when we were surveying it. Otherwise, if you were just going through it, you know, you could swim through it. But it's just, you know, when you're surveying, you've got to stay steady and then you've got this current, you know, working against you. But once you get past that, you get to uh, another big area called the Pyramid Room, which is a really large room, like I want to say it's like 400 by 200 feet, 150 foot tall, wow. massive breakdown pile. And I'll tell you what's really cool to me is up at the top of that room, there are signatures from the original proprietors of Wonder Cave, um, you know, from the mother and uh, several of her sons, you know, for them to go in that cave, I thought was pretty cool and go that far back. And Wow. Um, but it's just big trunk passage beyond that. Just huge borehole. The widest section of the cave that we surveyed was 180 feet wide, and it was about 30 feet tall. So, I mean, you just, just massive trunk passage. And then at the end, boom, just shuts down. Flow stone just kills it. Ah. Uh, so when you say it, tourist cave, are you saying it was a show cave or it's just one that a lot of people go through that first, you know, those first few feet or whatever? It, it it was a show cave for right at about a hundred years, and I've got a really great webinar that I did for the um, NSS that's on their website on Wonder Cave where I talk about all of the history and depth, and then our survey. But yes, it was a commercial cave for a hundred years, and then it closed down in the early two thousands. And honestly, I don't see that as a bad thing because the cave you can see the impact that people put on the cave and now that it's been closed for 20 years you can actually see the cave restoring itself so i think it's a great thing the, the landowners are really awesome they still allow cavers to go in there you know if you've got a, a local grotto and you want to go you know just reach out to them they'll let you go in there no problem so it's, it's just nice that you know hundreds of thousands of people aren't just trampling through it anymore yeah no kidding so if you doubled the length of the known cave like what was i guess the uh was there a certain area that was not traversed before you got there or was it just something that where people had gone, but it just wasn't written down in the data or on the map 
or something like that? Was there one particular area that, that was hard to get through? Not particularly. We didn't really find a whole lot of Virgin Cave and Wonder Cave. There was one area where we did, but it was very difficult to get through and really an area you're only going to find when you're surveying. Mm. Um, But for the most part, people had just estimated the length. Ah. Tom Barr had actually mapped a portion of Wonder Cave um, in the 50s and he kind of had an error in his, I I don't know what they did wrong with their compass, but they actually showed the cave trending in a different direction. So that was a a big thing with our survey that, you know, showed that this cave doesn't go the direction everybody thought that it went. They thought that it just ran the ridge and went east into the cove, but it actually kind of did a big hook on itself and did almost like um, the shape of like a, a U and, and turned kind of under the mountain and then back on itself. So that was a pretty, you know, big thing with survey. And, you know, that's another reason why we survey is because you find Virgin Cave, but then you also know the accuracy of where the cave is. So you can put it on a topo map and then you can go walk the ridge, you know, and look for other entrances or, you know, things like that. Absolutely. Um, so what else as far as uh, surveying and project caving? Well, we've done dozens of maps, Jason has, and we've helped on, you know, dozens more of of projects. We love to help other cartographers. You know, Jason loves to sketch and then hand the notes over sometimes, you know, that's not always his responsibility. But some of the other, you know, big caves that we've done here in TAG, uh, Doodlebug Hole, that was a really big one. That at one point, I mean, obviously, at one point they all were, but it was the uh, you know the deepest cave in Alabama. It had a four hundred, almost a four hundred foot entrance pit. Wow. You know, before before fern was found and surprise pit was found, Doodlebug Hole was the place to go, <laughs> and it was it was surveyed in the fifties by uh, some folks, some cavers from Pennsylvania. And I, I wrote about all of that on my blog. There's so much history there too. That was a really great project. Um, we also surveyed. Another local cave over here we did during COVID, we surveyed Bible Springs Cave, which is a really popular roadside cave here in Marion County. You just, I mean, literally you park and it's right across the street, but it had never had a map. It had been surveyed twice before we surveyed it, and we actually had helped on the second survey, and that was over 10 years ago, but for whatever reason, the original cartographers just never drafted a map. So during COVID, us and uh, two other couples, uh, good friends of ours, were like, we're going to do this while everybody's quarantining. We'll kind of quarantine ourselves together <laughs> on our weekends during the summer, and that's what we did over over 10 weekends. Um, eight of those weekends, we were in that cave and surveying it, so that was a really great project, and we felt that was really good for the caving community to finally give the community you know, a, a usable map of that cave, and oh my gosh, it's a beautiful map, too, that Jason did. It's It's strange for me to hear something like a cave like like Bible Springs Cave that is so close and easily accessible I guess for for me in my Indiana perspective you know where we're 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 looking hard to find caves and cuz we've you know we don't have as many as you do down there but for something like that that's seen a lot of visitation but then again you have so many more caves than we do to hear that it hadn't like officially been surveyed or you know really looked at in an official uh, way it's just kind of it, – it's it's surprising for somebody like me to hear. But then again, you got a lot more down there. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, during the heyday when they were finding all of these caves, you know, they mapped – many of them, um, but many of them they just didn't have time for. And so you know, one thing, another a good friend of ours, Ben Miller, I don't know if you know Ben, he works for the USGS and he's from Missouri and he does a lot of caving. He reached out to us over 10 years ago and he, he had this project called, uh, you know, surveying the unmapped 100 foot pits of tag and he he called it the low hanging fruit and so that's kind of like how bible springs it was low hanging fruit it was a great summertime project it's hot outside you get in a wet cave you come out and you know your wet feels great and so we helped him with that project of his and i wanted to mention that because ben's a good friend of ours and we did a lot of mapping of all those hundred footers and tag you won't find one now that doesn't have a map because of that project you know he called it um (laughs) We called it the the deep 
pit assassin squad it was called the deep ass <laughs> dpas and uh, so that was that was another really fun project that we did because you know there's all these hundred foot pits you know a lot of people collect them but now they all have maps <laughs> yeah yeah well and you, you talked about the one the one cave that you own you know 160 feet and uh you know here in indiana that'd be record breaking like here our deepest pits 142 and so you find anything around or just even of course just over 100 that's a big deal here in indiana but yeah down there yeah. that ain't nothing um no but it, it they're all important and need to be uh need to be documented so i mean we could stay in tag for this whole hour, but how much caving have you done outside of tag? Um, I've, I've done some, mostly with the, the National Speleological Society conventions. Um, I've done a lot of conventions. My first one was 2011 in Colorado. I've been to uh, West Virginia. We did Missouri, Nevada. South Dakota. I, I know I'm missing one. So I've done a lot of caving with those. Missouri was awesome. I, that was definitely a, a highlight of, of those conventions. There's a lot of great caving in Missouri. I've been caving in Florida. Anytime we go on vacation, if we can fit caving in, we definitely that that and breweries and wineries. <laughs> 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 All the stuff that makes life worth living for, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Any, like, high-profile projects, like things like Mammoth come to mind, Lechuguia, things like that? Um, I've, well, obviously never been to Lechuguia. Would absolutely love to one day. You know, Jason and I do a lot of surveying uh, together, and he's definitely got the skills to get us in there. Um, so maybe one day we'll get there. Mammoth Cave, we haven't done any surveying up there. We, we're not a part of the CRF because there's so many unmapped caves here in Tennessee. I mean, we, we're always busy. There's always something to do, and we just don't really run out of things around here. So we, we stay local a lot. We do travel every once in a while. We did actually apply for our passports in the last couple of weeks. So hopefully in the future, maybe we can get out of the country and do some caving too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, okay. So what are you working on now or what's coming? What are you planning on getting into? So what I'm actually working on right now, uh, project wise, we're still wrapping up. We did a big die trace project last summer over in Grundy County, actually right above Wonder Cave and the whole cove that Wonder Cave is in and the cove behind it, there was a quarry that had come in and started operating without without all of the proper permits. And so the, the county had this big battle on their hands. And with us being the cavers over there, the landowners reached out to us to do a die trace to show where the water runoff from this quarry, where it was going to go. And if it was going to go into any caves, you know, to try to use, they, they wanted to try to use that angle to try to help stop their quarry. And of course, we were happy to do it. Um, so we got funding uh, from one of the local communities, uh, the Deer Lick Retreat, and then the Tennessee Cave Survey gave us a significant amount of money for that project. And so we did the die trace and we did actually confirm, you know, that the water from that quarry would go into the caves. Um, but luckily, the county was able to stop the quarry so they they had our data our data didn't stop them but laws actually stopped them so i'm still doing some follow-up on that i'm hoping to make a mini documentary i've actually started getting into doing a youtube channel i started a youtube channel last summer mm -hmm. and so <laughs> i've been doing a lot of just our random cave trips on there just kind of gaining practice you know trying to learn the tips and tricks of how to edit the videos and things like that so my goal is to make a really nice mini documentary, you know, 30, 45 minutes showing the effects that a quarry can have on the caves here in this region. And then also part of our die trace and what we did and just kind of wrapping that all together with the, you know, the community as well and showing even how it affects people's lives that live across the street from a quarry. Um, so that's what I'm working on right now. As far as survey projects, we were actually talking this morning about driving out to another cave that we started surveying about seven years ago. We actually have to ride a four-wheeler five miles out to get out there to this cave. It's so, so remote. Wow. Um, but unfortunately, what happened, the reason we didn't finish it seven years ago, because we're not one to start a project and not finish. 
Um, but we got scooped, unfortunately. <laughs> and it really put a damper on the project and we just sat the project aside. And so we've done all this other things in between. And so now we're like, we need to get back out there and finish it because it's, it's not about our ego. It's not about any of that. It's about the cave. And the, we feel like the cave deserves the map. We found over about half a mile of virgin cave there. Um, and Jason has started the map. So we just really need to finish it. So we're going to go tie up those loose ends and get that done before it gets too hot to start going out there. Well, and, I, and I'm not looking for drama or anything, and we don't have to name names. Maybe you don't even know the names. But when you say you got scooped, you mean that other people went out there and just did the cave without doing any actual work on it or what? Well, the person who scooped us had actually helped us on the project initially. Uh. Um, we, he helped us do a, a dome climb in there. And so I don't know if he felt like, well, I helped with the project. I should just be able to go anytime I want. But the way we work as surveyors is we survey as we go because that keeps the excitement up for the entire team. Yeah. So we were actually in the cave, Matt, in the cave, and he showed up. Oh, <laughs> so, what was that like? Yeah, so it was it was uh, very dramatic. Uh, Let's just say that, um, you know, obviously there were like, what are you doing here? You know, kind of questions. And so he later apologized to me. So that's okay. You know, we can move on from yeah, that. I forget yeah, him. absolutely. <laughs> well, good, good to hear. Cave photography is another thing that you're into. Yes. Yeah, so I, I initially got interested in cave photography when I first started caving. Nathan Williams inspired me. I, I would see his work and just be like, wow, like, how can I do that? And so I re actually reached out to him and he invited me to come along a on a trip. This is when he lived at um, the Tumblin Rock Cave Preserve when there was a house there. And he was the uh, overseer or manager. I don't know what they call their title is of the cave. But um, so I went out there and went on a trip with him. And it was just amazing. He taught me so many things. He actually was like, here, let me see your camera. And he showed me how to do things on my camera and just gave me that inspiration, you know, to, to start doing more cave photography. And since then, I've actually I've had three covers on the NSS News and Ooh. I've I've gotten several awards at NSS conventions, and I haven't been doing a lot of photography here lately. I've, I've been kind of cheating a lot with my Google phone, my Google <laughs> Pixel. <laughs> That's not cheating. <laughs> the phones have come so far. If you can figure out how to do your lighting and then, you know, even put the phone on a tripod to give it that steadiness. I mean, you can get some amazing photos out of, out of the, uh, the cell phones now. But I'll tell you one year, this is kind of funny. We always joke because at the NSS conventions, there's always photos of Valhalla and Never Sink, you know, in the slideshow. And so I took a photo at Valhalla with my cell phone and I submitted it to the salon and sure enough, it made it. <laughs> it was kind of, we were just kind of joking, like, let's see if the Valhalla photo will get in, you know, and it was with a cell phone and it did, you know, but. But no, we love to do cave photography when we can, but obviously cave survey is number one. So a lot of times it's hard when we're surveying for me to do photography because I'm hands on with the survey as well. So I do it when I can. And Jason, I have to give him a lot of credit because he helps me a lot, especially when we're using flashes. He's really good at doing the setup for the shot. And then I take the photo. So I get more credit than he does, but he's definitely a huge help on those for me. I mean, the technology is just going to keep changing. Uh, and I'm sure that you've taken, it sounds like you've taken pictures in caves, I, I guess you might say the old fashioned way with maybe like a nice SLR or something like that. But then you've also done the cell phone thing. Have you found that the the technology, especially I guess the software and the way that the phone automatically sort of processes the image and sort of determines your lighting and everything, have you almost found that it's easier to make it look good when you're just taking a cell phone picture because it will auto correct that sort of stuff? Oh yeah, most definitely. Yeah. But I do believe that there is still a crisp crispness of that course. you get with the old style photos that you don't get with the cell phone photos. Um but the, the they definitely have progressed and made it a lot easier and I will say a lot lighter. There's been so many trips where I've carried three Vivitar 283 flashes and my camera wow. and vertical gear <laughs> and robe. So it's just like, it definitely makes it a lot easier and lighter. 
Yeah. I was talking to uh, Carol Vessel. Actually, no, she was doing a, a, a presentation for our grotto. Carol Vesely was, and she was talking, and she was raving about her, uh, I think it was a Pixel phone, just, mm-hmm. you know, talking about how it's so much easier now, um, you know, and like you said, lighter to get stuff around. Very, very cool. Yep. And, and they're more water resistant. <laughs> now they are, yeah. yeah. And shock resistant for that matter. Yeah, it's like they finally realize that uh, phones are used by people and we are definitely fallible. <clears throat> yeah, yep. Um, so is it, I'm sorry, I, this is it nothing to do with you, but you, you, you mentioned, you know, back when there was a house at Tumbling Rock. Is there no house anymore? No, it's been torn down. Nobody oh, okay. lives there on site anymore. They do have camping there and, you know, you can obviously still visit the cave, but... Um, I don't know what their reasoning was for all of that, but it's, I think it's been a few years that it's been gone. Yeah, it must have been. Well, I mean, I was there in late 16, and the house was still there, and, and I think he was still living there. But, yeah, I didn't, I hadn't heard that. Anyway. All right. Well, and you're also editing some publications? Yes. Um, so, obviously, with my love of history, I love to write. So that kind of got me into doing guidebooks. So I started out doing, the very first guidebook I did was the SARA 2010, and SARA is the Southeastern Regional Association of the NSS, for those who didn't know. Um, But I did the guidebook for that caving event in 2010, and I just enjoyed it so much. I've done several other SARA guidebooks. I actually was the editor of the NSS Members Manual for five years. I, I could have kept doing that. I really enjoyed doing that, but I feel like when you volunteer for a position, you shouldn't hog that position for 20 years, so to speak, or 15 years, you know. So I felt like doing it for five years was a good opportunity and then, you know, pass that torch on to somebody else to do it. Um, and then I also here recently, the last few years, I've been doing the guidebook for the Tagfall Cave-In. So I really love doing mm-hmm. those guidebook. And, you know, it gives me an opportunity, too, because it's hard to get content. Um, so I can put some of my photography, you know, in those guidebooks as well. This this last year's Tagfall Cave-In guidebook, all of the full-page photos I did of my female caving friends, because I'm a big promoter you know, for female cavers and encouraging them and building them up and teaching them skills and making them feel confident that, you know, because for a long time, caving has been very male dominated. And there's been many times where I've been the only female on a caving trip. And so I feel like it's important, you know, to pass that knowledge along to other female cavers and build them up and show them how to rig a pit. And so when they go and they're around all these, you know, males, and sometimes, you know, you can feel a little nervous, you know, and that way they feel confident and know, hey, I know this pit's rigged right, or I can rig it, I can, you know, and and inspect it and just have that confidence in, in knowing that. You heard about this Chick Fest thing that's happening this year? I have, yeah. Chick Fest is actually not new. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's been around for quite some time, and then it kind of faded off there through COVID. So I, I saw the post that they were re- resurrecting it. Um, so, yeah, I did see that. I've been to many Chick Fests in the past. My my good friend Jenny McKee and I and a few other ladies actually kind of started our own uh, ladies caving group about two years ago, if you will, uh, called the G spot grotto. <laughs> <laughs> so it drives a lot of the men crazy that we use that terminology for it, but we have our own little private Facebook group and our banner and stickers, and we do our own trips and, you know, we're not male exclusive. We always have our token mail or two on the trips, you know, but, but we try to promote that, you know, just that, within the, the females in the cave and community. I think when any group of any sort of demographic or psychographic is underrepresented, you get to have your own thing. And that's totally mm-hmm. fine with me. You know what I mean? And by the way, Chick Fest is uh, in direct competition with my event, uh, Indiana Cave Capers this year. So <laughs> pick your poison, uh, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, we might, if, if Cave Capers will let me be a vendor, we might be there. <laughs> I oh, haven't yeah? looked at my calendar yet. So, <laughs> I mean... Chick Fest is going to be right down the street for me, and I do a lot with my G-Spot group, so I don't feel left out if I don't attend Chick Fest this year and I go to Cave Capers because, hey, then it gets me up in Indiana. (laughs) There you go. There you go. So, I mean, I guess after all that, uh, let me just say this. Thank you for um, volunteering to do that kind of stuff because, I don't know, 
maybe it's different down there where you've got maybe a few more cavers, but it's always hard for us to find people to volunteer for that kind of thing. Editing a newsletter, you know, putting together a guidebook, really anything volunteer worthy, whether it's grotto leadership or uh, or anything that doesn't involve the actual caving itself. I mean, just thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I enjoy it. It's been a, a big part of my caving resume, so to speak. <laughs> I love giving back. I just, I can't help it. I just love sharing. You know, I share a lot on Facebook and I I had a Flickr for a long time because I know a lot of people don't get to see what we get to see underground. They're fascinated by it. They'll never go, you know, so I like sharing it. (laughs) Yeah. So can you tell me then, Sarah, um, are you still involved with Sarah? Um, not really. I was at one point uh, pretty heavily involved with Sarah when I, when I was more involved with a grotto. So I was even the vice chair and then the chair of Sarah, because if you get in the vice chair, then the next year you automatically roll to the chair. So I did that. And then when I was involved with a grotto, I would go a lot to the meetings. But the way it works is basically the people that go to the meetings and do a lot of the business you've kind of got to be there representing a grotto. And so we've kind of drifted away from being heavily involved in grottos because we have so much of our own stuff going on. So I'm not really involved in the organization, Sarah, itself so much anymore. Gotcha. Gotcha. I just asked because I'm going to be there this year. Um, Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go down there and hopefully get some caving interviews done and uh, hopefully some caving too for that matter. (laughs) It's. It seems like a great event. It'll be my first time. They can be a little dry because <laughs> um, they're long. I, I don't know how long the meeting is this year. They used to start them like at 9 o'clock in the morning, and then they went to like 9 o'clock at night, and they had this huge break in the middle for lunch. So the last time that I was a part of one, I changed it up that year, and I said, we're not meeting until after lunch. We're going to skip this long lunch. We're going to condense everything down between 1 and 4, and then we'll you know, have a break and then do the presentation because it just it takes up somebody's whole entire day and i hate the thought of sitting in the, you know indoors especially on a saturday if it's nice outside. oh my god <laughs> kelly <laughs> i did the exact same thing when i was chair of the central indiana grotto and this was full disclosure this was per the suggestion of one of the long timers who had been on the board for a while he was like look if we could keep these meetings to 90 minutes or less, that would be optimal. Can we do that? Yeah. And I said, yes, absolutely. Let's do that. Let's let's mm-hmm. end the talking around everything ad nauseum. Let's just try to condense yeah. and get everybody and be re- out of there and be respectful of their time. I, I am 100 percent with you there. Yeah. But I will say, you know, in the past, I, I just want to mention this, too, is, you know, part of my caving resume. Jason and I both have received the Sarah Award, uh, the Richard Schreiber Award. Yeah. I don't know if you know who Richard Schreiber was. He's been name dropped on the podcast yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. He was a very well-known tag caver um, who we lost too soon uh, during the 60s and 80s. Uh, he did a lot of caving and mapping around here. So we received that award because it was basically – it recognizes somebody who's doing a lot of contribution to caving and tag. And then I also received in 2018, the Avis Money hospitality award. I don't know if you know who Avis is, but she was another great tag legend, you know, that we lost. Uh, it's probably been seven, eight years since we lost her, but she, when you met Avis, you felt like you had known her for a lifetime. She was so welcoming. Well, I appreciate that sentiment for sure. Something else I'd I'd like to mention, you know, Jason and I, we're both life members of the NSS. Caving is a lifestyle for us. You know, we, we, we moved here for it. Uh, we've dedicated our lives to it. We understand the importance of, you know, building great relationship with landowners. We both have received our fellow awards from the NSS. I mean, so, I mean, we're, we're definitely all in for caving. It's, it's just a huge part of our lifestyle. Yeah, I I uh, I want to be able to pull the trigger on the life membership uh, sometime, but <laughs> getting that getting that extra thousand bucks uh, in and out of the bank account is uh, yeah, it's 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 sometimes a little prohibitive. But one of these days, one of these days, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to get that cool license plate. <laughs> do you have those yeah. on the car? No, we don't. Um, what we did though is when we got married, we we had signed up to be a sustaining member, which you pay one year's dues and 
like an additional $80 towards your life membership. And you did that for 10 years because it was $800 at the time. Mm. And so we told people when we got married, hey, just call the NSS. Don't buy us a gift. Give us money towards our life membership. And so several people did that. And then after like two or three months, Jason was like, I'm going to pay mine off before the end of the year. And I was like, <laughs> Like my head spun around. I'm like, what? Oh, I can't let him do that and me go on this plan for 10 years. So then it became a competition for us. So like every month we were throwing money at it and just throwing money at it. So he beat me, but within a year we had, we had paid off our life, our life dues. So. Oh, wonderful. Well, that's, the, I mean, then, and then it's just, you just forget about it at that point. You know, I just, my membership just I'll come, I'll come clean. My membership just lapsed for maybe a month and a half. And then I just, you know, I re-upped a little bit ago. Um, it used to be that it would automatically re-up and then something went wrong at the website. So if you uh, if you think you're a member, you might not be. You might want to check on that. <laughs> yeah, it is nice not having to think about that ever again. And especially, too, because, you know, there's some caving events where you have to be a member to get in or you have to be sponsored by a member. So, you, yeah, you don't even have to think about it anymore. Kelly, you're uh... – your caving journey is inspiring, especially uh, when it comes to caving with cancer, which is an uh, impressive thing to just even say and have be true. And it sounds like you've done an awful lot and you're nowhere near done. Um, okay. Kelly, thank you so much for your time. This has been great. Yeah, you're most welcome. I've, I've certainly appreciated it. I can tell you I was pretty nervous going into this interview. I'm always nervous before I do a presentation. And Jason kept asking me this morning, Why? 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 <laughs> um, but I'll say you, you've made it very easy. I've enjoyed talking to you. Um, and the nerves are no longer there. So I appreciate that. <laughs> well, I, if, if it makes you feel any better, I mean, I've been on the radio for more than 20 years and I get nervous every time I make that light turn red. So uh, yeah. being nervous, I think, is a good thing. It focuses you. And I, I mean, for what it's worth, you certainly sounded focused. So <laughs> thank yeah. you, Kelly. This was wonderful. You're most welcome, and thank you, and happy caving. Happy caving, indeed. Oh, goodness, how cool was that? Kelly, thank you. Thank you, and what an inspiring journey. Caving with cancer. And I'm thankful Kelly was able to beat it. Um, so next month, I'm talking to Kevin Mulligan. He is one of the uh, co-creators of The Gauntlet which is a caving-themed ropes course challenge that was at Indiana Cave Capers last year and lots of other events. And uh, we talk about where it's going to come this year and what it took to put the thing together and how it developed. And um, he's done an awful lot that we get into in the interview. I can't wait for you to hear the talk with uh, Kevin Mulligan on April 1st, April Fool's Day. No tie-in there, I promise. And uh, thanks to our sponsor, Sophie Reptress, Get a Cave Suit. A custom cave suit, cover it in bat stencils. I don't think she'll mind. SophieReaptress.com. Thanks to our past sponsors as well. SwagoGear.com gets you a nice pack. Uh, organic Robot Designs in Greenfield, Indiana. If your grotto needs t-shirts, 